Hello again 122 in this video we will go over some of the long-term causes of World War II and the immediate causes in Europe and in the Pacific and main things we're going to talk about first is Europe and the first occasion where Hitler is not stood up to is in his creation of an air force and a week later the introduction of a military draft that would expand Germany's army from 100,000 to 550,000 troops. And this is Hitler's unilateral repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. And it brought a reaction from France, Great Britain, and Italy. They condemned Germany's action and warned against future aggressive steps. But nothing concrete is done. And meanwhile, Hitler gained new allies. In October 1935, Benito Mussolini committed fascist Italy to imperial expansion by invading Ethiopia. And Mussolini welcomed Hitler's support and began to draw closer to the German dictator. In October 1936, Hitler and Mussolini concluded an agreement that recognized their common interests. And a month later, Mussolini referred publicly to the new Rome-Berlin Axis. Also in November, Germany and Japan, the rising military power in the Far East, concluded the anti common Turn Pact, or the Anti-Communist International Pact. That is the agency that the Soviet Union was attempting to spread the worldwide revolution with. And Japan and Germany agreed to maintain a common front against communism. And by 1937, Germany was once more a world power, as Hitler proclaimed. Hitler was convinced that neither the French nor the British would provide much opposition to his plans, and he decided in 1938 to move to achieve one of his longtime goals, the Union or the Anschluss with Austria. And this is the second long-term cause. By threatening Austria with invasion, Hitler coerced the Austrian Chancellor into putting Austrian Nazis in charge of the government. And the new government promptly invited German troops to enter Austria and assist in maintaining law and order. One day later, on March the 13th, 1938, after his triumphal return to his native land, Hitler formally annexed Austria to Germany. And nothing is done. Hitler's next objective was the destruction of Czechoslovakia, and he believed that France and Britain would not use force to defend the nation, that nation, and he was right again. On September the 15th, 1938, Hitler demanded the cession of the Sudetenland, an area in northwestern Czechoslovakia that was inhabited largely by ethnic Germans, and he wants this back in Germany, and he expressed his willingness to risk world war if he was refused. And then the Munich conference is held, and instead of objecting, the British, the French, and the Germans, Italians, at a hastily arranged conference at Munich, they reached an agreement that met all of Hitler's demands. And on page 656, there are opposing viewpoints of the Munich conference. You have Neville Chamberlain's speech to the House of Commons, justifying the appeasing of Herr Hitler by allowing him the Sudetenland. And then you have the opposing speech from Winston Churchill condemning these actions as this is only the beginning, Mr. Churchill believed, and he was right. German troops were allowed to occupy the Sudetenland as agreed upon at Munich. And increasingly now, Hitler is convinced of his own infallibility. And he had by no means been satisfied at Munich. And in March of 1939, now he occupies all Czech lands, Bohemia and Moravia. And the Slovaks, with Hitler's encouragement, declared their independence of the Czechs and became a puppet state, Slovakia. That's an independent country again today, ladies and gentlemen, of Nazi Germany. And on the evening of March 15, 1939, Hitler triumphantly declared in Prague, that he would be known as the greatest German of all. At last, the Western states reacted to Hitler's threat. When Hitler began to demand the return of Danzig, which had been made a free city by the Treaty of Versailles to serve as a seaport for Poland to Germany, Britain offered to protect Poland in the event of war. At the same time, both France and Britain realized that only the Soviet Union was powerful enough to help contain Nazi aggression, and they began political and military negotiations with Stalin and the Soviets. Meanwhile, 
Hitler pressed on, and to preclude an alliance between the West and the Soviet Union, Hitler negotiated his infamous non-aggression pact with Joseph Stalin. And secretly in this agreement, it comes out after the war, they had agreed to divide up Eastern Europe between Germany and the Soviet Union. And this shocked the world on August, or August 23rd, 1939. And then the treaty with the Soviet Union gave Hitler the freedom to attack Poland. He told his generals, now Poland is in the position in which I wanted her. I am only afraid that at the last moment some Svein or other will yet submit to me a plan for mediation. And that's from Documents on German Foreign Policy, Series D, Volume 7, London, 1956, page 204. He need not have worried. On September the 1st, German forces invaded Poland, and two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany, and Europe is at war again. That is the immediate cause, the invasion of Poland, 1 September 1939. Now, the path to war in Asia. Question 2. During the mid-1920s, Japan had maintained a strong military and economic presence in Manchuria, an area in northeastern China, as we talked about, controlled by a Chinese warlord. Then in September of 1931, the Japanese military officers stationed in the area launched a coup, or a takeover, to bring about a complete Japanese takeover of the region. Despite worldwide protests from the League of Nations, which eventually condemned the seizure, Japan steadily strengthened its control over Manchuria, renaming it Manchuko, and then began to expand into northern China. And unbelievably, for the moment, Chiang Kai-shek attempts to avoid a direct confrontation with Japan so that he could deal with the communists, who he considered the greater threat. And when clashes between Chinese and Japanese troops broke out, he sought to appease the Japanese by granting them the authority to administer areas in North China. But the Japanese moved steadily southward, and popular protests in Chinese cities against Japanese aggression intensified. In December 1936, Chiang ended his military efforts against the communists in Yan'an and formed a new united front against the Japanese. And when the Chinese and Japanese forces clashed at Marco Polo Bridge south of Beijing in July 1937, China refused to apologize and hostilities spread. And Japan had not planned to declare war on China, but neither side would compromise, and the 1937 incident eventually turned into the Second Sino-Japanese War. The first one was in the 1890s. The Japanese advanced up the Yangtze River Valley and seized the Chinese capital of Nanjing in December, but Chiang Kai-shek refused to capitulate, and he moved his government upriver to Hankou. When the Japanese seized that city, he retreated to Chongqing, in remote Sichuan province, and he kept his capital there for the remainder of the war. So that's really the beginning of the war in the Pacific is in 1937 for the Asians. And this is a picture of the Japanese victory as they're riding under the arched Changshan Gate in Nanjing in January of 1938. And they had conquered most of eastern China by 1939. So what is in the works next? This is part of a larger Japanese plan to seize Soviet Siberia with its rich resources and to create a new Monroe Doctrine for Asia, or the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And on page 658, Japan's justification for expansion will be a lot like Nazi Germany's wanting these countries and wanting to expand into Eastern Europe and to take over the Soviet Union for living space or Lebensraum and the need for raw materials to fuel their war machines. And in this plan, Japan would guide its Asian neighbors on the path to development and prosperity. After all, who better to instruct Asian societies on modernization than the one Asian country that had already achieved it? And during the late 1930s, Japan began to cooperate with Nazi Germany on the assumption that the two countries would ultimately launch a joint attack on the Soviet Union and then divide up the resources between them. But again, the non-aggression pact with the Soviets in August 1939 compelled Japanese strategists to reevaluate their long-term objectives. The Japanese were not strong enough to defeat the Soviet Union alone, and so they began to shift their eyes southward 
to the vast resources of Southeast Asia. The oil of the Dutch East Indies, which is today Indonesia, the rubber and tin of Malaya, and the rice of Burma and Indochina, today Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. A move southward, of course, would risk war with the European colonial powers and the United States. But Japan's attack on China in the summer of 1937 had already aroused strong criticism and sanctions from the United States. And when Japan demanded the right to occupy the airfields and exploit the economic resources in French Indochina in the summer of 1940, the United States warns the Japanese that it would cut off the sale of oil and scrap iron unless Japan withdrew from the area and returned to its borders of 1931. And the Japanese viewed the American threat of retaliation as an obstacle to their long-term objectives. Japan badly needed oil and scrap iron from the United States, and should they be cut off, the Japan's going to have to find them elsewhere. So they're caught in a vice to obtain guaranteed access to natural resources that were necessary to fuel the Japanese military machine, which are available in Indochina. Japan must risk being cut off from its current source, the United States, and that would be needed in the event of conflict with the Soviet Union. And after much debate, the Japanese decided to launch the surprise attack on American and European colonies in Southeast Asia, as we'll see, in the hope of a quick victory that would evict the United States from the region. 